Robert Kane from University of Texas. Fine, I, I think I should start by, by saying that since the name of Texas was taken in vain earlier in this conference, that in, in behalf of Larry Sager and myself, I should make a defense. But I, I just will say one thing, that like Ronnie, I was brought up in New England, even though I've been in Texas for 40 years. Okay, there's much I agree with in Dworkin's impressive work concerning objective value, living well, respect, and many other things. On all these matters, it's a work that deserves to be widely read and pondered. There's much I agree with also in the chapter 10 on free will, ethics, and so on, responsibility, which is the specific subject of these remarks. Perhaps 90% of what he says about free will and responsibility in that chapter I agree with, but following the perverse custom of philosophers and because time is limited, I'm going to focus on the 10% disagreement. My disagreements stem from 40 years of dealing with the philosophical problem of free will and from the fact that unlike Dworkin, I, I am an incompatibilist about free will, the token one I, I suspect on this <laughs> panel, although I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. He offers two opposing models. Uh, Tim has explained this, but I'll just briefly uh, uh, remind you. He offers two opposing models to explain the freedom required for judgmental responsibility. The hydraulic model, according to which an act is yours and you are responsible for it, if it has its origin in an uncaused act of will. And the creative model, which he endorses, according to which an act is yours and you are responsible for it, if you have the capacities to form pertinent beliefs about the world and to match your decisions to your normative personality. The first, or hydraulic model, he argues, is incompatible with determinism but it is deeply flawed. Uncaused acts of will are mysterious, an outdated remnant of earlier ages, and have no place in the modern scientific picture of the world. The creative model, by contrast, captures what we mean by freedom and responsibility in everyday contexts, and it is compatible with determinism. Now, I agree completely that the hydraulic model is a non-starter, an outdated remnant of earlier times. And I agree that the creative model captures a great deal of what we require for freedom and judgmental responsibility, my 90% agreement. But the dichotomy is too simple. Suggesting that we must choose one or another of these two models, which is a mistake. One can reject the hydraulic model, as I do, and accept much of the creative model, as I would, and still believe that the traditional problem of free will is not really engaged much less solved by this choice. In my view, there has been a general tendency in the modern era, beginning with Hobbes and Locke, through Hume and Mill and many other worthies, to oversimplify the traditional free will problem, to reduce it to a simpler problem, and then to solve the simpler problem. As a result, free will, in the traditional incompatibilist sense, becomes yet another victim of the dissolving acids of modernity. What, what, is this, what is this traditional problem of free will that's thus deplate, deflated? It is the problem defined, by the way, by the 13th century Sufi uh, and uh, Persian a poet and philosopher Jalaluddin Rumi when he said that there is a dispute that will persist until mankind is raised from the dead between the necessitarians and the partisans of free will. I offer three cl clues about it, this problem, this very ancient problem. And I'll focus throughout on what Dworkin calls moral responsibility, uh, where we can speak of blameworthiness, as Tim mentioned, for it is especially relevant to both moral and legal contexts. The first clue comes from Aristotle, who said that if the circumstances in which you act, including the character decisions and motives from which you act, determine your action, then to be responsible for the action, you must be responsible for at least some of the circumstances, such as your character, decisions, and motives that led you to act as you did. This is no esoteric principle. It's woven into the fabric of our everyday moral and legal reasoning about responsibility. If a drunk driver kills a pedestrian and it could be shown that given the circumstances, including the visibility of the road, the condition of his nervous system given the alcohol, he could not possibly have avoided hitting the pedestrian. That alone is not exonerating. 
One wants to know whether he is responsible for any of the prior circumstances that placed him in a position where he could not possibly have avoided hitting the pedestrian, such as prior decisions to drink and drive. The second clue involves a story. Imagine a young man on trial for an assault and robbery in which his victim was beaten to death. Let's say we attend his trial and listen to the evidence in the courtroom. At first, our thoughts of the young man are filled with anger and resentment at his vile act. But as we listen daily to how he came to have the mean character and perverse motives he did have, a sad story of parental neglect, child abuse, bad role models, and so on, some of our resentment against the young man is shifted over to the parents and others who abused and mistreated him. We begin to feel angry with them as well as with him. Yet we aren't quite ready to shift all the blame away from the young man himself. We wonder whether some residual responsibility may not belong to him. Our questions become, to what extent is he responsible for becoming the sort of person he now is? Was it all a question of bad parenting, societal neglect, social conditioning, and the like, or did he have any role to play in it? These are crucial questions about free will, and they are questions about what may be called the young man's ultimate responsibility. We know that parenting and society, genetic makeup and upbringing, have an influence on what we become and what we are. But were these influences entirely determining, or did they leave anything over for us to be responsible for? That is the question we want to know about, that's what we want to know about the young man. The question is whether he is merely a victim of bad circumstances or has some residual responsibility for being what he is. The question, that is, of whether he became the person he is of his own free will seems to depend on whether these other factors were or were not entirely determining. This story tells us something important about free will. An aspect of the reductive tendency of the modern era I mentioned is to reduce the problem of free will to one of freedom of action. But freedom of will is not just about free action. It's about self-formation. How did we get to be the kinds of persons we are with the wills, characters, and motives we now have? Was it we ourselves who are responsible for forming our characters and motives, or someone or something else beyond our control? God or fate, heredity or environment, nature or upbringing, society or culture, hidden controllers, and so on. Therein, I believe, lies the traditional problem of free will. The third clue comes from the meaning of determinism itself. Determinism means given the past at any time and the laws of nature, there's only one possible future. Indeterminism means the opposite. Given the same past and laws, there are multiple possible futures. <coughs> Indeterminism implies a forking paths view of the future, which is the way we normally think about freedom. Determinism, by contrast, is a very strong doctrine. It implies that given the past and the laws of nature, any act a person performs is the only act that could have been performed in the circumstances. And so it would be with the young man. And the impossibility here is very strong, what the modal logicians call S5. In no logically possible world whatever can there be this past, these laws, and any other act occurs but the one that actually did occur. It can be shown that this is the doctrine of determinism that has worried philosophers like Rumi for centuries, whether in logical, theological, or scientific forms, and it's a strong and worrisome doctrine. <coughs> As one can see by considering what Israeli philosopher David Weidecker has called the W defense. If persons are accused of having done something wrong, they may ask, what should I have done instead? And suppose in the circumstances there is nothing else they could have done. Is this exonerating? Not necessarily, for they may be responsible by virtue of prior actions for putting themselves in these circumstances where there's now nothing else they could have done. Thus, we may invoke the Aristotelian principle, which, as I said, is woven into the fabric of our ordinary reasoning. The problem is that if determinism is true, there's nothing else they could ever have done differently in their entire lifetimes to make themselves or their circumstances any different than they are. Now, compatibilists in the modern era from Hobbes and Locke onward have invoked a common strategy for avoiding this problem, 
They have defended a hypothetical interpretation of could have done otherwise. All we mean when we say persons could have done otherwise, they argue, is that they would have done otherwise if the past had been different in some way. If the persons had had different beliefs or desires or reasoned or chosen differently, they would have acted differently. But this strategy is deeply flawed. Immanuel Kant aptly called it a wretched subterfuge, and William James called it a quagmire of evasion. Many objections can be made against it, and even many prominent compatibilists uh, have, today have rejected it. To his credit, Dworkin does not appeal to this traditional strategy. It may be true that persons would have done otherwise if the past had been different in some way, but the past was not different in some way. It was as it was. Our freedom and responsibility must be exercised in a world that actually is, not in some hypothetical world that never was. A second strategy common to more uh, recent compatibilists to which Dworkin does appeal is simply to deny that moral responsibility for actions requires that we could have done otherwise at all. This strategy is more subtle but also flawed, I think. For it's true that we can be held responsible for many actions, even though we could not have done otherwise, and even if the actions were determined by our then existing characters and motives. Often we act from a will already formed, but it is our own free will by virtue of the fact that we formed it by choices and actions in the past for which we could have done otherwise. If this were not so, there's nothing we could have ever done differently in our lifetimes to make ourselves different than we are. So there's a subtle fallacy of composition here. We can do this for some acts, but not for all in our uh, lifetime. Or if you have karmic tendencies, it does not follow that this could be true for all acts in all of our lifetimes. Yet determinism implies that it is. A third and final, and I'm just about done here, a third and final strategy of compatibilists, which is employed by Dworkin also, is to say that incompatibilist free will makes no sense because it reduces either to chance or to the mystery of uncaused causes. Responding to this strategy is a much harder and longer task than I've been working on for 40 years uh, and can't obviously pursue it here. But I believe one can reconcile incompatibilist free will with modern science without supposing it reduces to mere chance or mystery. The task is not easy, but I think many developments in modern science themselves make it more likely than it may have seemed in the past. Um, so I am not what Dworkin calls a pessimistic incompatibilist. I believe we have free will, but an incompatibilist nonetheless. And I think one can be an incompatibilist about free will and agree with most of the good and right things he says in his book about morality, law, living well, and, and even creative freedom. So to end on an ecumenical note, while it's important for Dworkin to reject the hydraulic model, it's not essential to his overall project that compatibilism be true and incompatibilist in every possible form be false. Thank you. <laughs>